So in my next series of videos, I'm going to be showing you how I make a reclaimed lumber kitchen table. Um, the original uh, source material that the customer sent me was a photo that used reclaimed material. However, this won't be using reclaimed material because at least by me, because reclaimed, especially barn wood, is extremely popular. Um, it's hard to get and it's also quite expensive. It's also usually pine, which is not necessarily a great material to make a kitchen table out of, unless you're 100% um, okay with that table over time getting dings and marks because pine is so soft. So I'm going to show you how I used some rough sawn oak um, to get the same look as reclaimed lumber without planing or um, going through, I jointed the, the top so that I didn't have any seams, but even on these ones I basically just used the table salt to make my aprons and, and a chain salt actually to make the legs so that I don't have a lot of that smooth, clean surface which will make making this look like reclaimed lumber once it's done much easier. So like I said, this should be about a two-part series. The first part is going to showcase making the base and the second part is going to showcase making the top as well as the finish. So to start, I'm using some of these big chunks of lumber I have in my shop. You might have seen them in the background of some of my videos. And um, the legs for this are extremely thick. They're a little over four and a half inches thick. Finding lumber like that is kind of hard. It's also extremely expensive. So I decided to just um, cut up one of these planks I already had in my shop. So I'm doing that with a, with a, a chainsaw, I'm just going through and making a nice curved cut all the way down. I don't think I showed in the video, but when I get a little past halfway, I'll flip it over and then finish the cut on the other side. I'll end up using the skinny piece in a different project, not this one, but I ended up using this entire piece of lumber. So you can see at this point I have flipped it and I could finish that curve cut. Now these I got as a barter for making a cutting board. So um, it was kind of free material to me. And this is actually going to a friend of my sister's. So I like using kind of special materials on people I know. So then once I have it laying down on the ground, I'll clean up that face a little bit. The chainsaw, I get a pretty nice cut on it at this point. I've done this enough times, but um, that, that handheld plane will clean everything up. So then with the chunk I have left, I'm making two more curved cuts and I have one little skinny piece in the middle and then those two edges are going to be my legs. And like I said, these were a little, over, they're about three, um, four inches three quarters square at the end of the day so I'm cutting them a little oversized and you'll see I'll clean them up on the table saw so same process I'm about through with this and this is all yellow pine um, I don't mind using yellow pine it's it's I think it's a nice grade of pine and since these lays are so thick I'm not nervous about them getting beat up and since they're already beat up and the customer likes that you don't really have to worry about it so those are my two chunks. And then I could take those and, and cut them down to size with the circular saw. I end up cutting these with the circular saw and then cleaning them up on the table saw. And I don't believe I have footage um, of cleaning them up on the table saw, cutting them down to size. You get a little nicer cut. These are so thick um, that I had to go through all four sides in order to actually cut through the whole piece. So it left a little bit of an uneven cut on the edges. So I just rough cut them down to size and then I'll final size them on the table saw. That's basically what each leg's gonna look like. So then I put my tall fence on my table saw and I could clean these up. The nice thing about older lumber like this is the grain is usually pretty dense and very straight. So even those rough edges are flat and I felt pretty comfortable sending these through my table saw to clean up that one face. You could see the chainsaw cut was pretty good, but I'm just um, removing a little bit of that material because these inner faces are going to be where I'm putting uh, my mortise joints. So I want them somewhat square and flat. And then speaking of mortise joints, this is what I'm using to cut those because these are so thick, I couldn't use my mortising machine. So I'm just using a three quarter inch bit with a jig I built. I have this jig on my channel if you wanna see how I made it. Basically I have two fences that can ride between the piece and I could cut um, down 
for my mortise. Now I'm just using pencil marks in order to, to show how far to slide it. You can see I'm sliding it up to that pencil mark. You could set up stops, but I found to have no problem with pencil marks. So I'm making haunched mortises on these pieces. So I went about three quarters of an inch down and then I made two more pencil marks. And you could see I'm then gonna go a little over another inch down. These ended up being a little over two inch um, mortises, which will be a little over two inch tenons, just because the legs are so thick. I wanted a lot of material to hold them together. Otherwise the legs will start to move around on you. So you can see I was just following my marks and then I have that haunch tenon. So the, the back section's a little bit deeper than the front, which is a little more shallow. This is just a little bit of a close up view of how I'm doing that. You can see I'm, I'm sinking it in on that one pencil mark, riding it to the other pencil mark, and then sending it back till I, till I get all the way down to where I want it to be. Now I gave this customer the option of having removable legs, but I recommended that they be permanent they're more stable in general, but like I said, with legs this size, if they were detachable, I'd be nervous. They use there's so much weight to them that they would really start to, to come apart more often than um, other legs if these were only put together with hardware. So we decided to go with permanent, permanent mortise and tenon legs. And then you can see since it's a, a router bit that leaves a circular, circular edge, I'm just cleaning it up with a chisel. So then to make the aprons, I'm starting with some rough lumber. I'm making a couple tables. So I went and got a bunch of um, four quarter red oak from my lumber guy. He had just gotten this out of the kiln and it it's, was uh, milled from local trees, which is always kind of a cool thing. So this was flat enough on the edge that I felt comfortable enough sending it through my table saw. And that will keep the rough look of it. I don't have to plane or joint it. Um, if you are a novice at the table saw, I don't necessarily recommend sending rough lumber like this through the table saw because of the bows and cups and twists in it. That's, these are usually the sorts of cuts where the wood will bind with the blade and, and um, people get injured because they're not used to, to cutting unflattened stock. You can see I have my riving knife in my table saw to kind of avoid any pitfalls, but I've also been using a table saw for long enough that I felt pretty comfortable cutting this stuff. It also didn't have any huge twists in it, which is usually what will what will catch on the blade. So I'm just cutting these pieces down. My aprons are about four and a half inches uh, wide. I wanted them a little bit wider once again, just because this is going to be a very heavy table. So then to start making my tenons, I'm going to make them on my uh, radial arm saw. And since this material is bowed, you can see some of it I have to shim up just so I get a flat surface um, to contact with the blade. If I didn't do this, then um, my cuts would be uneven. And I'm just going down, since that's a three quarter inch mortise, I need to have three quarter inch material left in the middle. So I just raise the blade. I do a couple test cuts until that tenon's the right thickness. Then I can remove all that excess from those kerf cuts. This is pretty easy work with um, a chisel. It's always nice working with oak. I really like oak as a lumber. It's not super popular, but I personally do enjoy it. Then you can see that's that cleaned up tenon, and then I could just add the haunch part to it. So I'm just marking the same, I'm, mar I'm basically mirror marking what the mortise is on the tenon, and then I could remove that with a saw, and that will be my haunch tenon. So this is about two thirds the, the length of the tenon and about one third down is the rough measurements I use for this. This just makes a sturdier joint. You can see once it, once it fits nicely in there, I could go through and cut the rest of them. Um, there's always a little bit of cleanup to do. You can see there's a little gap left. So I'll go through and clean up that joint. But in general, these were nice, nice clean fits. And I put together my two edges first. I was pretty happy with how all this was turning out. And you could see I, I what I did was I put the 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 um the clean cut of the yellow pine on the inside so that you have that reclaimed look it will be the first thing you see on the table when it's on the outer edge. And I'll stain that yellow pine a little darker so it's not such a big contrast. But that's why I wanted that yellow pine on the inside edge. 
And then these are the long aprons. I'm not going to go through this whole process, but it's exactly the same thing. I cut the aprons down to length. The length is based on um, the table, which is about six feet long by about three feet wide. And accounting for the, the depth of the mortises and the overhang of the tabletop. And then I can dry fit this all together. So this whole thing is dry fit together without any glue or any hardware. I say this in every video, but that's why I, I like the effort of the mortise and tenons. Not only is it a superior joint, this will last a lifetime, but I also find it makes glue ups much easier when your piece can hold itself together. And that's kind of the rough, the rough base. And there it is, a little bit of a better view. The problem with making tables in my shop is things get really tight very quickly and it's hard to get a good view of it. So before I glued this together, I added um, three three quarter inch dados on the inside of the rails just so that when it's glued together, I could add some three quarter inch stock in here and those will be the horizontal supports for the table. Sometimes I do this all at once. I'll add the supports as I'm gluing everything together but on a big piece like this I just find it's easier to leave these open and then add them later I don't think I film adding them but you'll see it in the finished pro uh, project sometimes when you're when you're gluing up something this big and you're you're trying to glue a bunch of pieces it could just be a nightmare stuff will start setting up on you especially since it's still summer the glue sets up much faster but I could basically go through and add glue to all of my pieces. I glued up my edges first and then I kind of propped up some two by sixes on my table saw so that I was, had a nice flat surface to then glue these together and this is where my camera dies and I don't get any footage of me adding those long aprons but basically I just add these in. You can see the dado cuts um, and then that's where the camera dies. So in order, to, I didn't have clamps long enough for this. You could see I put temporary pieces of poplar in those dado grooves in order to clamp my edges and then also a clamp across the back. 